Let's begin here. BTK, one of the most notorious serial killers in the history of our country. A sick, sick individual. His name is Dennis Rader. And he's been behind bars for a while now. It's been a while, right? There he is, locked up, admitted everything in court, cameras in the courtroom. We saw it, it all happened. But now there's an investigation into an unsolved case, actually a couple of them, but one of them in Osage County, and they were digging up evidence in this case. This is from Tuesday, and this is evidence that we believe and, and investigators believe are going to link BTK to the murder of a 16-year-old cheerleader. Here's BTK's daughter, Carrie Rawson, speaking with our own Matt Johnson about it. The latest right now is that there is a 1976 cold case with um, Cynthia Kinney um, out of um, Osage County, Oklahoma. Um, she was a missing person. She went missing from a laundromat in Pacheska, pa um, and no one knows what happened to her. And so starting in around January of this year, my dad was contacting um, other outlets and letting them know that he was being questioned. On, on Cynthia Kinney. And then um, in the end of May or early June, my dad contacted outlets again and told him he was being investigated on Shauna Garber, who was a woman that was found um, dis like murdered in um, the fall of 90 in um, just in the southwest corner of Missouri near Joplin. Um, and so that one is being looked at by um, by investigators in McDonald County. This is a huge development. I'd like to bring in a special guest, a man leading up this investigation, the Osage County Sheriff, who's working that Cynthia Kinney case. Sheriff Eddie Verdon is with us. Sheriff, great to see you tonight. Thanks so much for joining us. You bet. Let's put this together. So, um, how does this, how does this investigation sort of? start gaining momentum. What was it that, that led you to start to try to put these pieces together? Well, of course, back at the time for disappearance, nobody knew uh, who BTK was, and uh, he was not well known at that time. In fact, as you know, it was 2005 before they actually uh, got him identified and arrested. But in uh, December, I started looking uh, from information off a uh, television show uh, about BTK. Through that, I learned that he was a ADT installer. Uh, I learned that a lot of his crimes were Monday through Friday, uh, eight in the morning to noon time range. And this uh, case, the victim disappeared in the middle of the week, uh, mid morning, and. There was a bank being constructed across the street at the time, uh, which would have been about the time for the pre-wiring to be done uh, for the alarm system for that bank. So we just initially started off looking to see if there was any possibility that ADT could have uh, installed that bank alarm and if he could have been in the area. This is this is amazing. So you're you're watching some sort of documentary about th this this killer you hear a couple little things and did did you did it like did it like hit you like that or or did you have to well, wait a minute how, how was that moment because this is amazing to me well you know i, I had looked at this case uh years ago probably in 2006 or 7. Uh, i had went through it looking for for any new leads anything like that uh, didn't didn't really find anywhere to go with the uh, investigation at that point. So I knew a lot of background on it, and as I was watching, I seen some similarities or or some things that raised suspicion. So again, ADT was one of those, and uh, he was a regional installer. Uh, also, another connection we had we had gotten another tip on this case back in probably 2012 of someone that uh, had, had located or seen something years ago up by an old Boy Scout camp on the north end of the county. And looking into Dennis, he, he was a Boy Scout himself until he was 
uh, I think around 17, their scout camp was not too far north, uh, right on the Kansas-Oklahoma border. So there was a lot of things that, that needed to be looked at. Of course, we went to the bank, couldn't confirm who the original security company was, but by research, ADT had approximately 80% of the commercial alarms in the United States at the time. So, you know, first we reached out to the bank to see if we could find out if ADT had any uh, involvement with that bank security system or alarm system, and there was no records or anything we could locate. So when, when we couldn't get any of that information, we decided to reach out to Wichita to see if there was any possibility that we could look at their case files, you know, in the hopes that we could find some type of ADT records. And uh, of course, we learned that there was no ADT records um, located from, from ADT back at that time. So we decided to just basically go to a background interview with Dennis to see if he would talk to us and just see if there was any connection to our area or anything we could learn from a background type interview. And how did that interview go? W was he cooperative? Was he, did you get the sense that he was being truthful and, and what did you take away from that interview? Well, you know, at the beginning, he, he agreed to, to talk to us. There was actually two of my investigators uh, that that were there and, and a DOC investigator that sat in the room. And, you know, he started off with, he only committed the 10 that he confessed to and there was no others, but he would be willing to cooperate and give any, any help he could, you know, towards any case. We had made it clear that we weren't gonna go into our case at all, give no information. Basically, all we told him is we were looking into him old case from 76 and what we wanted was just information about him so he basically said where where would you want to start and i said your first memory and we took off from age three to uh to where he was now including going through uh nine out of his ten murders and the different jobs that he had throughout his life and uh basically his entire story and as he was breaking down for us uh, that story, he, working for ADT, put himself from Ark City, Kansas, Cedarville, uh, Coffeyville, Cherryville, Independence, all across the Oklahoma, Kansas border. And of course, he told us that was when he had his opportunities to, uh, to be himself, have his uh, hotel parties do prowling, breaking and entering, different things, uh, being away from home. Uh, that that was something that, that he did. You know, in addition to that, he, he really talked about the Flint Hills, Otter Creek, different things in our area that, that, that are pretty significant and, and had a lot of knowledge about that. How about his journal? I understand he had a journal entry involving a bad laundry day. And, and how did that tie into your investigation, your suspicions here? Well, um, if it's okay with you, before before that happened, when, when he was going through that story and showed that, that premiere with, with the area, uh, we knew we were going to have to look at him. So we, we stopped the interview as he was going into his 10th murder and as as we were concluding he told me I, I was in oklahoma a lot in 1990 i i worked for the u.s census which was pretty shocking for me because i didn't know that and he told me he was all over oklahoma and kansas through that period because he'd been laid off at adt and had started for the census in 89 and, and worked for the census through uh 1990 and then as we concluded again he told me about a fantasy that was his favorite that he never got to commit and he told me that he always wanted to kidnap a girl from a laundromat so i asked him you know if if he'd ever got to do that fantasy how he would do it and he explained to me that he would have washed the the laundromat till she was there by herself and then he would have approached her with one of his rouges 
got her to his vehicle and he would have had her nobody would have seen or heard anything so at that point we concluded that knew we had to go to wichita dig further so through that information uh and some of his uh book that he was creating in 1976 he's got a project he called bad laundry day and in that notation he has it marked for chapter nine and chapter nine of his book was his actual murder so uh, that started the investigation of course uh full ahead to, to try to find all the information we could and and we're still pursuing leads today so how how close are you do you think to solving this cold case well again we're we're hopeful we're moving forward looking into additional information you know of course we didn't reach out to media he had reached out to media on two previous occasions and then uh, someone had had called the media over us being in Park City uh, doing the dig and it's continued and of course for for not just uh, our victims family but but anybody that was a uh, a victim or, or survivor uh, from from those crimes you know we as law enforcement we we don't want to we don't want to reopen those wounds and, and and have the families relive those situations you know when you know a cold case can go cold again or leads can't be found so you know the the victim's family as well you know they had no control they're they're victims of this just just like the uh, victim family members so you know we we've still got to keep investigating but but we've got actually a lot of uh, really good information and uh, have made contact with with numerous different people that have additional information that we think will will hopefully lead us to uh, to be able to get an answer in our case and maybe answers for some other agencies how important is it for you it, it seems like this is one that's been with you a long time and i think oh absolutely you know i mean when when, when you have a, have a young person that's abducted and you know years and years have went by with no answers uh we 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 want to get justice uh for for that victim and and for their family and answers and closure and that's our hopes and we're going to pursue it as as long as it takes or as far as we can go and and hopefully get get this this finished and those answers found sheriff uh, again i'm, I'm going to reiterate how amazed i am that you're you're watching a program and you remember something from you know 20 years ago almost 20 years ago that you investigated but those facts remain there and when you saw something you put put that together so quickly um the folks in osage county are really lucky to have you sheriff thank you so much i appreciate it thank you amazing folks i, I mean and, and you see here from many members of law enforcement with, with these cold cases they don't forget they don't stop it's like it's like i want to figure this out i want to get justice for that family and hopefully that happens uh all right we've got a lot more to get to up next the think tank joins us as we take a closer look at the evidence and potential new cases against btk Record. Yeah, my father's a huge narcissist, so he's a sexual sadistic psychopath and a pathological liar. And so he absolutely loves the attention. That's Carrie Rawson talking about her dad. Her dad is BTK, uh, Dennis Rader, uh, the buying torture killer. Um, new developments in, in this case. We spoke with the sheriff on, on one case. There's another case they're looking at. I'm trying to connect him to all of this. Let me read a statement from BTK's daughter. She uh, released a, a long statement, um, so here's part of it. In January of 2023, I became aware of the missing person case of Cynthia Cindy Dawn Kinney, a 16-year-old cheerleader who disappeared from a laundromat on June 23, 1976 in Pawhuska, Oklahoma. In June of 2023, I became aware of the unsolved murder case of Shauna Garber, 
whose remains were found near Pineville, Missouri in December of 1990. I have returned since to the Osage County Sheriff's Office to work in a volunteer capacity as an active agent of law enforcement assisting on these two cases, including visiting my father twice at the El Dorado Correctional Facility. Beyond these two cases that have been released publicly, I'm not at liberty to discuss other possible missing persons and unsolved murder cases that are being actively investigated as possibly committed by my father. This past spring, federal transaction immunity was offered to my father in the tri-state area by a federal district attorney's office to give my father a chance to confess to any other violent crimes he may have committed from roughly 1963 to 2005, giving decades-long grieving families long-sought answers. And in return, my father would not be charged in these cases. I will continue to partner closely and heartily support all law enforcement agencies and offer my volunteer assistance. Together daily, we can make a difference. Let's keep working together to solve these cases for these families. They deserve all that we can give them. We can join together to put our mark on modern interagency cooperation and modern forensics. And that's Carrie Rawson. Amazing, um, you know, how she's been able to you know, do what she's doing in light of finding out who your dad is and what he did. Amazing. So here's a, a part of BTK's journal entry uh, involving this so-called laundry day, right? Because you have one of the cases in Osage, uh, a young woman was last seen at a laundromat across the street from uh, where some work was being done by um, ADT. Now, at BE, and again, these are his words, so I don't know exactly what it means, at B or BE of house off 17th had problem getting in or too much noise factor. The brunette was the target. I would watch nearby laundromat for possible victim. C, C9, hit PJ bad wash day. Laundromat were a good place to watch victims in dreams. Sometime I have a pair of women underwear on and after watching a girl or a lady relieve myself in the bathroom with thoughts. Mm. Wow. Let's bring the think tank. Joining us tonight in Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney Eklund Mercy. Also with us in Los Angeles, California, former federal prosecutor Nima Romani. And in Phoenix, Arizona, criminal defense attorney and the lawyer who represented Jody Aries, Kirk Nermy. Great to see everyone tonight. Um, what do you think here? It seems like he's not taking credit for these, um, Eklund. He, he was proudly standing up in court at one point, mm -hmm. taking credit for murders. Um, do, do you think that he could be this sociopathic, that he would admit to some but not admit to others and not give those families an opportunity for an answer? Well, I mean, I think his daughter is making it so hard for him. I have to acknowledge just how much bravery and courage it takes for Carrie Rawson to do what she's doing. As a, a criminal defense attorney, I know people who legitimately will lie on the stand or even not take the stand, exonerating live people just for the reputation of a dead person. So for her to stand up in real time and not condone her father's actions, not make excuses for it, but, but sincerely with all her heart, try to find closure for families has got to be acknowledged because um, cruel, um, hurting people, you know, people that are scared and frightened can potentially be some of the most cruelest people. And it's not their fault because it's justified. And for family members of people who are charged with these heinous crimes, for them to come out and um, really uh, seek the truth is just admirable. Absolutely, I'm with you. Uh, Nima, what are, what are your thoughts here uh, on this case? You saw that uh, the feds were offering some level of immunity for a long period of time, 63 to 2005. Um, what does your gut tell you here? Well, Vinny, I mean, that's really important because in this case, he didn't have to face the death penalty because Kansas didn't have the death penalty until 1994. So when you start going into different states like Oklahoma and Missouri, some of which reinstated the death penalty as soon as the Supreme Court made it legal again in 1976, 
it can matter. Maybe, you know, for one of these other victims, all of a sudden, you know, this monster can be put to death. So these investigations are obviously important to the families of these missing victims, but also to maybe get some justice uh, that really has, has escaped uh, one of the worst serial killers in U.S. history. Another important point I want to raise is obviously, you know, my heart goes out to the daughter and her bravery, but she was actually instrumental in finding uh, and breaking this cold case open because we've talked a lot about these familial DNA matches, right? Golden State Killer, Rex Hurman in New York. And it was her pap smear in, at, in college that was, I believe, um, law enforcement got to and was able to match the DNA of one of the victims to her. And that's how this case broke wide open. Uh, Kirk, I want you to take a listen to more of Kerry Rawson uh, speaking with Matt Johnson here talking about uh, this particular murder. If you will go back and look in these cases, he's actually saying he didn't do these. And for somebody like my dad, and honestly, somebody for Rex, in Rex's case, I don't see either of them ever claiming anything they didn't do. So what do you think here, Kirk? Do you think he didn't do this and that's why he's not taking credit? Is it something else going on? Is there any... any reason for him to not take credit for a murder that he actually committed being the sociopath that he is yeah i mean his daughter mentioned it that he was she was he was a psycho sexual sociopath and i think the another thing she said that was very important was the idea that he wants attention if he would have took that plea if he would have took the immunity and confessed it would have been over but now instead of those 10 life terms behind bars, he's getting more attention. Maybe he's going to get another trial. Maybe he's open for the death penalty. Whatever it is, he has sick ends, and the attention that he gets, I think, feeds him. So this is something other than going and being in his jail 24-7. So he might very want, very well want to challenge these charges so he gets a trial, gets attention. Yeah, we, we haven't paid much attention to him recently. He, he tried to uh, get everyone to pay attention to him uh, when the Long Island serial was, killer was arrested and called him, oh, a copycat, you know, sending those letters like he, like he always does. Um, so what do you think here, Eklund? Do you think at some point we're going to look at new charges here against BTK? Uh, I don't know. I, don't, I think that they need more. Um, however, he's a sadist, so... Um, you know, you don't know what enjoyment he's searching for. Is he's look is he looking to be the center of the attention because it's not his body, or is he looking to be the center of attention so that they, you know, force them to prove their case? So again, we are not dealing with a normal person. We're dealing with a sadist. So we don't we don't know. And we won't know until he tells us.